I'm Michael Barish, and I'm thrilled that you've joined us today to learn about cancer prevention in the 9-11 community. Basically, our job is to give you resources so that you can reach out to either us or to any of the people on this panel and learn more to help you, to help your families protect your legal rights and receive the medical care that the government is now providing you. So having said that, I'll just quickly introduce everybody. Dr. Barron is, is with Lenox Hill at Northwell, and he's been with us on several other webinars, usually talking uh, during Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Um, this happens to be Cancer Prevention Month. So we have Austin D. Savino from the American Cancer Society. We have Dr. Shaston from Montefiore Einstein Cancer Center. We have Liam Lynch from NICOSH. Uh, those of you who have uh, visited us before know my partners, Dom Penson, Dana Cohen, and Lee London. And finally, we have Brian Frieders from the Firefighter Cancer Support Network. Thank you all for agreeing to do this panel with us. And let's get going with a short video that will set the stage. The first thing that I hear from the non-first responder community in lower Manhattan is, you know, oh, I, you know, look, I... I'm sick, but I don't deserve anything. I'm not a first responder. I just, I just lived here. I just studied here. I just went to school here. I just raised a family here. Your presence here was an act of courage and resilience. The first responders, I I'm in awe, but I also am in great awe of those who came back to a war-torn neighborhood that was clearly toxic. We knew it, but you stayed anyway, and you allowed this area to grow and to become the hub, but it's, it's your courage and your resilience that brought this place back. So please, I urge you, access what you are owed. Over the last decade, we have all fought very hard so that everyone has access to the health care that they need. It is very important that every community member who lived anywhere south of Houston understands that you are covered. You are part of the group of people that have guaranteed health care if you have a 9-11 related disease. I was on my way to work when the first plane hit. I was working for Goldman Sachs. I actually worked for them for a total of 21 years. I always thought that, that those programs were geared for the firemen and the police officers, but I, I'm one of the victims of that. So we have taken on, with all of these advocates here, the task of trying to get everyone to understand that they have rights, and it is imperative that they sign up. It's also critical that we reach our students and our staff members, our teachers who were in the schools 18 years ago. One of the really surprising things about our research is that an event in 2001 can continue to have echoes 17 and 18 years later, such that it is as though never smokers are smoking two packs a day. Our law firm now represents over 25,000 people in the 9-11 community. The majority right now are first responders, but every single day we hear from more and more survivors because we're doing this outreach. Basically, to be entitled to compensation, you need to prove that you were below Canal Street or on the Fresh Kills landfill, either caught in the dust cloud on 9-11, or for 24 hours during the month of September 2001, or for 80 hours, which is just two full work weeks between 9-11 and May 30th of 2002. And you need to get two people to sign an affidavit attesting to the fact that I saw him, I worked next to Joe, I went to school next to Francis. That's all it takes. There's a reason why my firm takes all this so personally. I have six young people who work for me who have lost a parent or a spouse as a result of World Trade Center toxins. Nine people in my law firm, including me, are cancer survivors. The information you get from us is gonna be compassionate and it's our pleasure to help you. Please be each other's advocates and help us spread the word so that other people take advantage of these rights. I think all of you would agree you remember the infamous words of Christine Todd Whitman of the EPA when she told us all the air is safe to breathe. Remember that?
Well, it wasn't safe. Over 69 cancers have now been linked to the World Trade Center toxins by NIOSH. And NIOSH administers the World Trade Center Health Program, one of two programs that was set up when Congress passed the Zadroga Health and Compensation Act. So I want to start with Dr. Shastri. Thank you very much, doctor, for joining us today. You are a hematologist at Montefiore Einstein Cancer Center. Um, can you tell us what is a hematologist? Yeah, that's a great question. Hi, everybody. And I'm very excited to join you on this call and share with you what I know. And uh, hopefully some of this will guide you for your future care and, uh, you know, just inform you of various options that you have. Uh, so as a hematologist, uh, we treat patients with blood cancers with chemotherapy, but we also treat them with bone marrow transplants. And some of you might have heard of recent uh, therapeutic options like cellular therapy or CAR T cells. So we employ lots of different ways of treating people with blood cancers. My specific presentation is actually focused on some work that was done at Einstein uh, in collaboration with the Leukemia Lymphoma Society and the FDNY and the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center specifically on early detection of precancerous conditions uh, that could be a future risk for blood cancers and first responders after 9-11. So when you think about why, you know, what the why you get cancer, this is a very loaded and hard question to answer, and often the hardest question for me to answer with my patients. Many a times when I see people with a new cancer diagnosis, in addition to knowing how the cancer should be treated, people do have questions about why do I have cancer, you know, and why, why did I get it? Did I do something that increased my risk for having cancer? And most of the times we don't have a great explanation for this, but we do know that environmental exposures do add on to whatever underlying genetic risk that we have for developing cancer. Dr. Barron did a really nice job of explaining underlying genetic risk for breast cancer. And similarly, there are underlying sometimes genetic risk for developing blood cancers as well. But this can be potentiated or made worse by exposure to damaging chemicals, radiation, and then, you know, we have occupational hazards, right? People that have exposure to noxious gases at their work, and these things can increase your risk of developing cancer too. So right after the 9-11 disaster, we actually uh, started this project at Einstein, where in strong collaboration with the FDNY, we started really collecting the history as well as looking at the blood of all the firefighters that were actually exposed to the World Trade Center disaster. And we compared it with controls. So when you say control, it means a group or a population of firefighters that were not exposed to the World Trade Center disaster. And we studied their blood as well. And we wanted to see if there are increased rate of acquisition of mutations so these bad deleterious mutations that can cause cancer and whether that increases your risk for causing leukemia. So actually, so I just want to show you this, that the, there was dust that was, we, was collected from the site. And as you know, this, you know, there was a massive cloud dust all over Manhattan and into the other boroughs for several days. Uh, that settled into the surrounding area. And then researchers collected samples from three different locations to actually study the composition of this dust. And some samples were taken on day five and then a few afterwards on day six. And when we analyzed the composition of this, you know, it seemed like the dust that was collected from the World Trade Center was highly toxic. And if you look on the right side here, the schema shows you 
that it had so many different chemicals that we consider carcinogenic, you know, pesticides, benzol containing compounds, PCBs, asbestos. Um, so this was actually highly carcinogenic. So this was actually a publication in 2018 in JAMA Oncology, a prominent journal in the field that publishes original peer-reviewed articles in oncology. And this research actually showed that there is a blood cancer called multiple myeloma that we frequently treat. And the firefighters that were exposed to the 9-11 World Trade Center disaster actually had a higher rate of a precursor condition or a pre-disease condition to multiple myeloma that we call MGUS. So what does that mean? So this is basically something where we are able to pick up increased protein in the blood, but at that point, it hasn't become myeloma yet. So it gives us a chance to actually intervene and clinically follow these patients to see if and when they become at risk of developing myeloma, we can actually start treating them earlier rather than later. Sometimes when people develop myeloma and they present, they can have a serious me medical emergencies like kidney failure or very low blood counts. Uh, very high protein levels uh, that may cause other problems. So this is in a way we know that this is a precancerous condition that we found was uh, kind of increased. So this is again just to show you that this particular study, you know, did have a lot of press when it came out. And I think it kind of did uh, awaken the general public to the fact that yes, there could be blood cancers too, that could develop after exposure to 9-11 or just toxic air quality, and that this is something to be cognizant of. So I just want to say thank you very much for your attention. And I went over some very basic things. I want to just also just reiterate that at this point, in terms of blood cancers, we do know that there could be pre-conditions or pre-disease conditions in the blood for people who were exposed to the 9-11 World Trade Center disaster. And these can be picked up with simple blood tests. And if people do want to check them out, they are easily available. You can talk to your doctor or I'm more than happy to talk you through your risk or whatever you need to do. Uh, please feel free to get in touch with me via email or I left my number there to schedule an appointment or to give you a call back. I'm happy to discuss this further with you. So thank you for your attention. Dr. Shastri, thank you so much. Uh, the reason I wanted you and Dr. Barron on today's uh, Cancer Prevention Month webinar is that the World Trade Center has published, or the, the health program has published, the most common cancers in the 9-11 community. Breast cancer is, is the third most common cancer, but fourth, fifth, and sixth are the blood cancers. Dr. Barron, thank you again for coming back. Now, I know your specialty is breast cancer, and so I'd like you to address that and, and assure people who have breast cancer, it certainly is not a death sentence. Well, thank you, Michael. Um, Unfortunately, breast cancer is still the leading cause of cancer in women, as you can see from this graph on the right-hand side. Uh, it's the most common cancer in women, um, whereas in men, prostate cancer is the most common. So each year, there's about close to 300,000 women diagnosed with breast cancer. Fortunately, we cure most of them, most of them with it. Unfortunately, about 40,000 go on to die of the disease. Lung cancer is still the leading cause of cancer-related death in men and women. So there are a number of risk factors you can change. For example, we know that alcohol, even a small amount, increases your risk of breast cancer. The recommendation is try to limit it to one, one drink a day, if not less. Uh, body fat, even modest weight loss, reduces the risk. Those who are physically active will have a reduced risk of breast cancer. Interestingly, there's also really good data that if you exercise regularly and you're diagnosed with breast cancer, you have a better survival. So even if, you're, even if you start exercising after you're diagnosed, so that's an important thing. Diet, 20% uh, lower risk of death from breast cancer in those of the balanced low-fat diet group. So it's all the same things you're hearing about with heart disease also lowers your risk of breast cancer. Um, also, those who went on combined hormone therapy for many years for menopause have a slightly higher chance of getting breast cancer. 
There are a number of factors you can't uh, change. Obviously, being a woman increases your risk the most. Basically, one out of 12 women will develop breast cancer at some point in their life. The risk increases as you get older. Unfortunately, I've seen a number of people recently in their 20s and 30s with breast cancer, so you can develop it at a young age. Those with dense breast tissue have a higher risk of developing breast cancer. Early menses, late menopause, things, again, you can't really impact. If you had a prior biopsy, it's just something called atypia. Those have a higher chance of getting breast cancer, and I'll touch on that in a few minutes. If you've had prior radiation to the chest for other types of cancer, such as Hodgkin's disease, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, those patients have a higher chance of getting breast cancer. And obviously, a family history of breast cancer uh, increases your risk. Interestingly, you don't have to have a family history of breast cancer to get breast cancer. Um, many a patient I have gets diagnosed, and they're kind of upset that they don't have a family history. How can they get it? They certainly still can. And a thing you also, many of you know about is the genetics of breast cancer is talked about a lot these days. So this shows the mammography, you know, you may hear some controversy periodically about the benefits of screening mammography. These are women with average risk, no family history, no other risk factors, but it's clearly been shown by the American Cancer Society that mammography reduces the risk of dying of breast cancer, which has happened in the late 1980s. There was a big spurt, uh, spurt, people getting mammograms. And as you can see, we saved anywhere from 380 to 600,000 lives um, with mammography. So it was a 42% reduction in um, death from breast cancer. So it's a big benefit to mammography. So in summary, so breast cancer is the most commonly diagnosed cancer in women, but mortality rate is definitely dropping. While some factors can increase the risk of breast cancer, um, this some can't be changed, uh, many can be. We've made major strides in our knowledge about the cancer genetics, as you heard about, and screening mammography definitely saves lives. Thank you. Dr. Barron, I, uh, every time I listen to you, I learn more and more. We got a question, and, and it, it lines up perfectly with what the theme of today is, which is Cancer Prevention Month. So many women, so many men, miss their annual doctor appointments because of COVID, not only one year, but two years. And I was wondering, have you, did you see a lot of women miss their mammographies? Oh yeah, um, there's, there was a lot of strong data that the patients were not coming back for mammography. And we definitely saw a bump up in patients who when they were coming in, um, had node positive disease, had uh, more aggressive cancers. Uh, luckily, we're kind of back to baseline now. It seems like most patients are coming back and getting their screening test done. I mean, we saw that with our clients who didn't go for their annual skin exams and their annual prostate exams as well. Don't miss your annual exams. Dr. Shatry, I don't know if you have heard this. We, we were uh, honored to represent Detective James Zed Roga. He died of pulmonary fibrosis at the age of 34. When they did an autopsy, they found in his lung tissue, ground glass, asbestos, chromium, lead, benzene. These are all known carcinogens. And this leads me to our next guest, Brian Frieders. Chief, would you tell us, was it limited just to New York City firefighters? No, and thank you very much for having me on today. Uh, my name is Brian Frieders. I'm the retired fire chief from the city of Pasadena, California Fire Department. Um, I joined the Firefighter Cancer Support Network at its inception in 2005. Uh, the first thing I just want to say is, you know, thank you, Dr. Barron. Thank you, Dr. Shastri, because, you know, the information you provided is so relevant. Um, I saw a message in the chat about what does this have to do with 9-11? Uh, it has everything to do with 9-11. Um, the information that you're receiving from these physicians is going to help you understand changes in your body that you may not otherwise have noticed. It may uh, assist you in being an advocate for your health care. And, and Michael, I know you'll agree that um, some physicians don't really understand the implications of those that were exposed to the 9-11 toxins in and around that area. And you have to be an advocate for your own health care. A lot of times these things get missed. And when you have this information that is so relevant and so important that we just heard, that helps you as the consumer, as the person who could potentially be a victim of this, recognize these symptoms early and get yourself examined and checked out so you can catch this in an early stage and have a, a very favorable outcome. Brian, yeah. I want you to tell us a little bit about what is the Firefighter Cancer Support Network and how many people do you know from California who either went to the Pentagon or to Manhattan after 9-11? 
Yeah, so the Firefighter Cancer Support Network is essentially an organization. It's a nonprofit that helps firefighters that have been diagnosed with cancer. And what we have is about 150 mentors who are also firefighters across the country that we that have had cancer, that have survived cancer, that uh, we are now able to pair up with to allow them to survive, allow them to have somebody to talk to, a mentor um, that can be seen or that can be talked to on a regular basis so that um, they're not alone. They don't feel like they're in, in the dark. Um, we've helped thousands of firefighters across the country. When they get diagnosed, they either send us a message to the website or they give us a call on, on our 866 number. And immediately that goes to our wellness coordinator. We find out what kind of cancer they are. We find a mentor for them. We pair them up so they're immediately in contact with each other. And, and it takes that fear of the unknown out of the equation. It helps people understand that they're not alone, that there's somebody there to fight with them. And that's why I'm so proud to be part of this great organization. Brian, thank you so much, or I should say Chief. So I'd like to now turn to Austin. I want to welcome you back. And would you please tell us a little bit about what the American Cancer Society is doing to help people once they hear those awful words, I'm sorry, you have cancer. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you so much for, for having me on. And just thank you to all the other panelists and doctors for sharing just the, the important information. And um, I'm, my name is Austin DiCivino. I'm the director of development here in New York City for the American Cancer Society. And very, you know, quickly, I'll just talk about who we are and what we do and how we can help. Uh, the mission of the American Cancer Society is to improve the lives of people with cancer and their families. And the way that we're doing that is through advocacy, research, and patient support. And we wanna ensure that everyone has an equal opportunity to prevent, detect, treat, and survive cancer. And that that's great, but what does that actually mean? What, what, what are we actually doing? Where is the money that we are raising actually going? Um, one of the, the biggest things that, that we fund and push forward is research. We are a 120 year old organization that started right here in New York City. And since 1946, we've invested more than $4.6 billion into cancer research. That's billion with a B. And that research is impacting people's lives here in New York City, across the country, and across the globe. Outside of the research that we're doing, we have services and programs that cancer patients and their families can take advantage of and that are there to help. Uh, the reason that I work for the American Cancer Society is actually the National Cancer Information Center. It's something that my aunt took advantage of when she was battling breast cancer. It is a 24 hour, seven days a week, online and via phone call accessible information center for anything related to cancer any questions you may have and you can call us any time of the day we have live operators we speak over 30 different languages most of our calls actually come in between midnight and 3 a.m because people are up at night they're diagnosed with cancer they don't know what to do they don't know where to turn one of the services we provide is free lodging if you're like me, I don't. I work in New York City. I don't live in New York City. I live in New Jersey. If I had to go to Manhattan every single day for treatment for a couple of months, I'm paying for transportation. I'm paying for a hotel. I'm paying for all these different things. We have over 30 Hope Lodges across the city. One of them right here on 32nd Street, um, and that is a place where cancer patients and one of their caregivers can stay for free as long as they need to. We have shuttles that go to the local. Um, cancer centers, that is a, one of the services we provide um, in the vein of, of access to care. You may live close by to a great treatment center, but if you don't have a car or reliable transportation, that makes no difference. So we have a program called Road to Recovery, which is basically Uber for cancer patients, where you can call us and we'll give, we will give you free rides to cancer treatment to make sure that you can get there and get the, the care that you need. We can connect you to support groups, um, we have access to help connect to whether it's free or discounted wigs or mastectomy um, products. There's a lot of different things. I could probably talk for the next five hours about everything that American Cancer Society can do. But if you do have questions, if you're newly diagnosed, if you have a loved one going through cancer, we are here to help. 1-800-227-2345. That's 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Call us. For, for any type of thing where if we can help you, we will find someone that can. 
Boston, thank you. I have to tell you, my partners and I visited the Hope Lodge on 30, uh, was it 37th Street? Yeah, 37th, yeah. And uh, we were blown away by the compassion and the care that the people who work there showed to all the patients. And it's our pleasure to support your wonderful work. So let's move on now to some of the benefits that the government created. So I'd like to start with Liam Lynch of NICOSH. Liam, thank you again for joining us. Tell us a little bit about NICOSH and the World Trade Center Health Program. Thank you so much, Michael. Thanks for having me. It's always a, it's an honor to talk about this. Um, so my name's Liam. I'm with the New York Committee for Occupational Safety and Health. We are a nonprofit made up of, of unions and labor organizations throughout New York City, and we advocate for stronger worker protections. So my predecessors and my colleagues were, were there after 9-11, helping 9-11 responders and survivors uh, advocate for themselves for health care, what eventually became uh, this Droga Act uh, that was passed, like Michael said, in 2011. So fast forward to today, why are we here in 2023 talking about this? Well, to this day, we have the World Trade Center Health Program, which is here for not only responders, but also, like Michael said, survivors, people who worked, lived, went to you know school down south of Houston Street in Lower Manhattan in those days that, that followed uh, on that day and the, the days, months that followed 9-11. So we know that there are over 100 different illnesses connected to exposure um, to that deadly dust. So the World Trade Center Health Program is going to have specialized doctors who are knowledgeable at, in treating 9-11 patients. And so the health program offers an annual medical monitoring for both for, for responders. And then for both responders and survivors, if you have a 9-11 related illness, all of your treatment is paid for. So that includes medical visits, medical tests, doctor visits, surgeries, prescription drugs, and also there's a really robust benefits counseling. Uh, we've talked a lot about physical conditions today, especially with, with cancer, but the health program also covers mental health conditions as well. So we're talking, uh, obviously, you know, PTSD, you know, panic disorder, anxiety disorder. There's obviously a huge mental impact um, that this took on responders and survivors. And so those conditions are also covered and care is also available. And it's really important to this day that people are in this program. You know, we know that there's a long latency period between the time of exposure and the time that you get an illness. So what I mean by that is 9-11 is, you know, 20 years ago, um, you could be exposed then, but you may not develop a condition um, related to your exposure 20, 30, even 40 years down the line. So it's better to get the care that you need, get the medical monitoring to make sure that everything is good. And God forbid, if something's not good, that you have the care by specialized doctors. So this is a really, really great program. Please, please sign up. Please pass the word along. And I am here at NICOSH to help you with any en enrollment assistance that you need. Thank you so much, Michael. Appreciate it. Liam, thank you and thank NICOSH. You guys are great and it's our pleasure to support the work you do. So let's talk a little bit about the other programs set up by Congress, which was the Victim Compensation Fund. Lee London is uh, in charge of the managing attorney at the firm for our VCF practice. Lee, would you tell us a little bit about the benefits that these people are entitled to by making a claim to the Victim Compensation Fund? Sure. Thank you, Michael. And thank you, everyone, for joining. So just so I can explain, when the Zadroga Act was set up, it was split up into two entities. You have the World Trade Center Health Program on one side, which is free medical care and monitoring for your entire life. And on the other side, you have the Victim Compensation Fund. That is a monetary award for your pain and suffering, economic loss, because many of our clients lost earnings due to their World Trade Center 9-11 conditions. But there are a few points that I just want to make. Number one is, is that if you were in the exposure zone, it's a presumption. You don't have to prove causation between you, you being in the exposure zone and then you having an illness down the line. You don't have to worry about whether or not you smoked or if there's a family history. If you were in the zone and you were diagnosed within latency, you qualify. Many people suffering right now are suffering from asthma, GERD, sleep apnea, respiratory conditions. They're also suffering from horrible cancers, but 
we don't want people moving forward on a claim once they get cancer. We want them moving forward on it today, even if you're healthy. So one major point is, is that if I'm speaking to someone with asthma, a survivor or a responder, and we go through both programs and I get them an award for, let's say, 90000 or 20000 because non-life-threatening illnesses for the Victim Compensation Fund, which is non-cancer, range from twenty to 90000 based on severity. So you could have two people with asthma, one person had five surgeries, the other person uses a nasal rinse once a month. You can always go back to the fund based on severity, so you never waive your future legal right. So if you got an award in 2014 for 20000 for asthma, and then in 2022, you get diagnosed with prostate cancer or breast cancer, you can go back to the fund, we amend your claim for additional compensation, and we can keep going back to the fund based on changing circumstance. Because not only does the VCF award a monetary amount for your non-economic loss of pain and suffering, but they also award for economic loss, loss of earnings. So I have many first responders. Um, I have Goldman Sachs employees. I have um, many survivors that go out on private disabilities because their cancers force them out of work and you can make an economic loss claim. And I'd like to introduce Dana Cohn, uh, who's co-manager of our family assistance team. Dana, tell us a little bit about what you do and what Dom does and talk about the wrongful mm -hmm. death cases that we're sadly seeing way too many of. Thank you, Michael. So the, the family assistance team uh, for our firm was created to help families who lost someone to 9-11 illnesses. And the, the sad truth is we had to create a, a separate uh, unit just to help families because th th this is a, a very common occurrence. Uh, we lose clients every single day to cancers and to serious respiratory uh, conditions, and we want to make sure that their families get the help that they need. The, the VCF will award pain and suffering awards, uh, 250000 in pain and suffering, in addition to whatever was awarded for the personal injury claim, $100,000 for each spouse, for each dependent as well. Uh, it will award uh, a compensation for lost household services. It will reimburse all funeral costs, uh, including burial, uh, monument. So all of that that the family has to pay for will be reimbursed and it will award lost earnings for people who, who died before they finished out their work life. There are financial implications of serious illness. There are financial implications to losing the breadwinner of a family. Uh, and we want to make sure we get our clients the help they need as quickly as possible. So let's move on to the last slide. And Don Penson, uh, would you um, discuss what people should do now? Sure. Thank you. What we can all do, all of us in the 9-11 uh, community for our families, to prepare them to file a claim if they should ever need to file a claim is number one. We can tell our families about these rights, right? Tell them about the VCF tell them about these claims that they could make in the event that you should ever pass from one of these awful illnesses. Collect your proof of presence. We didn't talk very much about that uh, tonight, but there are different ways to establish presence. Uh, if you worked for a company that was in the exposure zone, you can get a letter from them now, a letter that establishes that you were in the exposure zone during that eight and a half month period between 9-11 and May 30, 2002. That's very important. If you can get such a letter, get that letter. Uh, if you know of people who could be witnesses for you uh, to attest to the fact that you were here, you were in the exposure zone, you can get those affidavits now. Um, and, and put them away and tell somebody, tell your family, I got the proof, I collected the proof, and I, I put it here in this folder. And the other thing that you can do that we encourage everybody to do, not just the 9-11 community, but certainly if you're in the 9-11 community, get a will. Um, if you have a will, you get to decide what happens with the assets in your estate. 
right? And some part of these awards are payable to your estate. If you passed away and your family brings a claim, some part of this is going to be payable to your estate. You can decide how that award gets distributed, the part that goes into your estate, as opposed to having the courts decide based on objective laws that have may not really be right for you and your family. So you can take care of that. You can take care of that now. And then you get to choose who will be the executor of your estate. And that's the person you should tell about these things, that you should tell about these rights, about the affidavits. So we encourage everybody, get a will. Those are the main things that we can all do for, for ourselves now. Thank you, Dom. Please listen to what the doctor has said. Early detection is everything in preventing a bad outcome. Good night.